Okay, so I can see a few people joining now. So welcome to people who are just joining us. Some people still in the waiting room, so we'll give it a minute or two to let other people join. So welcome everyone. Uh, we'll stick a link into some shared notes in the chat while we're waiting. And uh, today's session is going to be informal. So we've got an hour blocked for this, but we'll see. Uh, it may be slightly less depending on how many questions you have. So we'll just give a few more minutes to people. I mean, Al, if you let me know when it's um, starting to slow down in the in the room, the waiting room, we'll, we'll make a start in just a minute. see a few more people coming in now so we'll just get one more minute okay well i i think it's now just gone after three o'clock so uh for those of you who are joining in a later time zone i think we will just make a start so we can get you um out of here a little bit earlier so welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the Fair Impact uh, virtual drop-in clinic for people who are considering applying to our second open call for financial support. Um, so what we'll do today is just give you a brief overview of uh, the, the offers on uh, that you can apply to, to join, a little bit about the application process. So a very brief kind of five minute recap of uh, the webinar that we ran uh, at the end of of January, but really the focus of today's session is to give you the chance to ask any questions that you have, anything that you want to know about the application process or anything specific, uh, specifically related to one of the support actions, just to help you make that uh, decision about whether to apply or not and how to make a good application. Uh, so welcome to you all. My name is Joy Davidson and I lead Work Package 2 in the Fair Impact Project, and we are the ones who administer all of the open calls. Uh, so I'll just give you a very quick introduction, if my machine works. Oh, seems to be stalled. <laughs> Actually, maybe Al, if you can share the screen, would that be okay? For some reason, my, yeah, my machine seems to have stopped. <laughs> Thanks very much. That'll give people a minute or two to, to log into the, the shared notes. So thanks again, Al. So just a quick note that this is being recorded um, just for those people who uh, have registered but maybe joining from other time zones and aren't able to join today. So um, if you don't want to have your face or your voice on screen, then feel free to make uh, questions in the chat or in the shared notes rather than unmuting or uh, turning on your camera, but as it is a very informal session, we certainly welcome those of you who do want to unmute and put your camera on, feel free to do so. So we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, just a very quick uh, reminder of what Fair Impact is. Uh, we're one of the Infra EOS projects that has been uh, supported to help realize the vision of the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, we are a large consortium of 22 partners across um, many European countries. And we have been working now for about almost uh, a year and a half. Uh, we've got about another year and a half to go. Uh, and we are really all about trying to help people implement uh, tools and practices that will support the realization of FAIR, uh, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data and other outputs, and with a, a bigger remit to have uh, a European Open Science Cloud, which is filled with FAIR data. So that's who we are and what we're trying to do. And we can move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. And to do that, we have three different sorts of support that we're offering. Uh, route one support is where we're working one to one with uh, different organizations, so national level initiatives, uh, repositories and data service providers. 
and research performing organizations. So we're, we have some support programs where people don't get any money, but they get our time and they get to work with us in a one-to-one -one capacity. Um, route two support, which is um, the financial support. And this is where we give you a little bit of money, which helps you to buy out some time to maybe look at a particular approach or a tool and to get familiar with it and put it into practice. Uh, this is what you're here today uh, to learn about, which is the financial support. And um, we will give you a bit of an overview of what we have to offer. Uh, but we did want to make you aware that there is another route as well, which is a series of public fair implementation workshops. So those are, again, freely available to anyone. And they are hour long sessions which, which just give you introductory information to a variety of tools and approaches. So keep an eye out for those. So in this open call that we're launching, uh, which launched at the end of January, uh, we have five support actions which you can uh, apply to join. So I'll give you a very brief recap of each of these. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because we have the support action providers here. And if you have any questions, they can give you a, a better answer than I can. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. So we have two support actions which are targeting uh, people who want to um, work with research software. So the first support action is assessing and improving in existing research software. And this is based on some work that we've done in the Fair Impact Project to come up with some metrics for assessing the fairness of research software and to implement those metrics into the Fuji uh, Automated Fairness Assessment Tool. So people who join this support action will work with the team to take a look at the metrics and try them out within the Fuji tool. And um, a key aim for us on this particular support action is to help you identify where uh, your research software might need a little bit of improvement, but equally we're looking to get your feedback on the metrics and uh, some feedback on, on whether we, we might need to uh, think about future iterations of these. So it's a, a bi-directional support action. Um, people who apply to this would get 4,000 euros to help them to take part. Uh, the second software related so, uh, support action is uh, to implement the research software metadata guidelines. And, and these came out again from the Fair Impact Project. Um, and these are intended to help people in the earliest stages of creating their research software to be able to start to think about how they can um, make sure that the outputs that they produce are fair. So people will be working with these uh, guidelines that have come out and coming up with ideas of how they can make use of them in a practical sense. So either with a particular uh, community or you know a particular setting, um, there's uh, room for people to think about how they might want to take these uh, guidelines and to work with them. And for this, you're getting 6,000 euros to work with that particular support action. So the next slide, please. Uh, so we also have another support action now moving away from the research software, which is looking at persistent identifiers, which are a really crucial part of the European Open Science Cloud and FAIR data. Uh, so we are looking to work with um, applicants who are interested in developing persistent identifier policies and more specifically trying to um, work with providers um, of PIDs and repository managers who might be interested in coming up with European Open Science Cloud compliant PID policies. Uh, so this is a fairly um, larger bit of work. Uh, it's it's 10,000 euros that is on offer for this one, uh, but you will be working to um, get some support on self-assessing where you are with regards to your capabilities for having a persistent identifier policy, and you'll be testing out a beta version of the FAIR Core for EOS Compliance Assessment Toolkit. Uh, so that is uh, another action you can apply to join. Um, for the people who are running data repositories, uh, we also have come up with a set of guidelines uh, and recommendations on becoming more trustworthy and FAIR enabling. And in this particular action, you'll get a chance to work with these recommendations and to put them into practice and to really test them out in your own particular context. Uh, context. Uh, and in this particular support action, you would get 4,000 euros to support your participation. And again, this is very much looking to get feedback. So this is the first iteration of the guidelines and there will be future work carried out at Fair Impact. So again, this one is really 
giving you a chance to try some early recommendations, but it's equally looking to get some feedback um, that we can take forward in the next stage of the work. And we'll just go into the last slide, which has got the last support action. Um, and this is to um, help improve the availability of machine readable policies. Uh, and this is a particular support action working with fair sharing and people who take part in this one. Um, it's really just to help coordinate some registration of policies within the fair sharing registry um, and to then consider how we can start to make use of that, that body of information, which is um, often quite difficult to find. Uh, when you're looking for policies, they can be difficult to find and, and uh, registries are one potential way to make them more visible and more comparable and more machine actionable. So uh, this particular support action is really looking to people to get people involved in helping to increase the amount of policies within the, the registry and to make use of that information. And people who join this support action will get 4,000 euros to help them to do that. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. What you will get from the support actions is um, a support package with some virtual workshops. Um, it's important to note that everything that you do within the support actions is virtual. There's no travel involved, but you will get a series of virtual workshops and as part of that, you will get access to some expert advice and guidance. Um, the financial support that I mentioned is there and it's between 4,000 and 10,000 euros per support action. And it's really there to um, help you to justify spending some time looking at some of these tools and resources because it can be very difficult. You might see something that's of interest, but it can be very hard to find time in your day job to, to make uh, the time to, to start to look into it. Oh, so really no. the funding is to help you to be able to, to make uh, that a priority for you. Um, you'll also help to make uh, an impact on these emerging tools and recommendations and guidelines. So it's your chance to help shape some of these things in the early stages. And a really uh, key feature of all of this board actions is the chance to learn from your peers, because I think there's a lot of knowledge and expertise um, that we've seen in the previous support actions. And it's great to bring people together and they get the chance to share and learn from each other. So if you move on to what we expect from you on the next slide, please. From you, what we really wanna see is that in your application, you're willing to actually take part and implement uh, the specific approach that's being offered. Um, we want to know that you're going to take part in the workshops. So, you know, even if you can't make all of them, hopefully you or perhaps somebody in your team will be able to join all of the virtual workshops. Um, there will be some independent work that you have to do. So, again, this is why the financial support is being provided. It gives you that um, a little bit of uh, support to help you um, do this independent work and to, to take the time to do this. Um, if there's any kind of specifications uh, associated with the calls re relating to expertise or particular skills that you have to have, then you would have to confirm that you meet those when you put in your application. Um, and the last two are really just, um, you know, we want to be able to share what we've uh, learned through the support action. So we want to come back to you and have a follow-up questionnaire and or interview just to see how you've gotten on, whether you've been able to use anything that you've learned and the willingness to take part in an exit interview. And this would be something that we use as the basis of a very short write-up of a co-authored fair implementation story. So that's what we would expect of you taking part. And we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, who can apply? We are opening the, the call to individuals, groups and organizations from public and private uh, performing research performing organizations. So this could be universities, it could be research infrastructures. Um, equally, we're targeting repositories, data, metadata service providers, and people who might represent national or international level initiatives. So it's quite a broad range of people who are eligible to apply. Um, for those who are in receipt of funding, you must work or reside in uh, a member state or associated country for the duration of the support program. So that's basically who's allowed to apply. And I think it's worth making clear here that you can apply as an individual. It doesn't have to go through your organization. Um, so you can consider which is the right approach for you. And then we can move on to the next slide, please. 
Uh, I wanted to let you know that we do have some FAQs. So today you'll get the chance to ask specific questions to uh, us about the different support actions and offer and how to apply. But if you do want to read through, we've collected a bunch of uh, additional FAQs and you can go to the website and have a look at those if they might help to answer any other questions that you have. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a quick screenshot of the application platform. So if you do choose to apply, this is the screen that you'll see. Um, you simply come in and choose uh, the relevant support actions that you want to apply for. And if we go into the next slide. Uh, and once you get into the uh, the platform, you just start going through the questions. Uh, we've intentionally kind of try to keep it fairly low burden on both the applicants and also on the reviewers. Um, so the, the questions we ask are, are not too many uh, and you have a short kind of number of words that you're allowed to uh, provide in your answers. Um, so really we don't want to see huge amounts of um, you know lofty aspirations. What we're really looking for in your applications is something quite practical that you, you kind of see a, a reason to be involved and that it will help you in your work and that you've got some tangible way that you might be able to take the work forward. So we're not really looking for you to, um, you know, work miracles. <laughs> it's a small amount of time and a small amount of money on offer, but in your applications, just please be realistic and uh, practical when you're, you're writing your applications. Um, you can start a draft and come back to it. Um, and once uh, you have submitted your deadline, your application by the deadline. It will then go into a re review process where three uh, reviewers will look at each application individually, and then there'll be a consensus view so that we get um, a good balance of, of views on the, the quality of the applications. So I think we can move on to the next slide, please. So I think we can stop sharing the screen now, actually, and maybe uh, move to the the shared document. Uh, so now it's really just over to you and to allow you the chance to ask any questions you have about either the individual support actions that we're offering, if anything needs to be clarified, or if you would like to have any further information on the application process. So I will go to the, uh, the shared document, see if there's any notes, and you can feel free to add anything into that. Um, so I can see a few that have come in. Um, I'll run through the, the the questions in order. So first question is, can you apply to more than one of the support actions? And the answer is yes. Um, we don't, we have an upper limit. No um, recipient can receive more than 10,000 euros uh, from the Fair Impact Project, but you can certainly apply to more than one of the support actions. Um, once you reach that 10,000 limit, we would just, you know, kind of have to, work with you to see if you want to be an observer or to take part in a, a different way, but there's that limit. Um, I've already addressed the need that you don't have to apply through your organization. You are welcome to apply as an individual. Um, I say this because sometimes it can be difficult to get your organization to jump through all the hoops <laughs> required uh, for four or 5,000 euros. So consider maybe going in as an, in an individual if, if that's the case for you. Um, Applicants for non-eligible countries, unfortunately, cannot receive funding. Uh, we're bound by the European Commission um, rules on how we spend our, the money. Um, and what we would say is that it's possible for you to join uh, in a, an observer capacity. Um, we would still require you to submit an application. Um, and that would go through the review process. But please do um, consider taking part as an observer if, if you are not eligible to get funding. Uh, so the financial support is to my institution or to you directly. And again, that is really down to your choice. Um, as I mentioned, you can apply as an individual um, working in a particular organization, um, but you can get paid that way. If you choose to go through your organization, then it would go through your organization. So it's, it's really up to you how you want to apply. And um, so what materials am I supposed to get from my organization? And I'm not entirely sure what is meant by this. So I don't know if, if the person who asked this wants to, to unmute and provide a bit more detail. Mm 
in terms of what materials? Joey, I haven't uh, written oh, the yeah, okay. oh, I, I heard someone talking. Is someone? Yes, I, I, I heard someone. Oh, OK. Go ahead. No, OK. I uh, <laughs> just wanted to say that maybe something about the payment. Uh, so if there is some administrative documents that are needed from the organization so that you can apply as, as an organization, would that be needed? Uh, not at the application stage. I mean, I think anything like that is something that we work out in the kind of post award phase. Um, we have the administrative side in, in DANS, which coordinates the Fair Impact Project. So they handle all of the, the financial payments. Um, so if there was any particular, uh, so far, there's been nothing terribly tricky. Um, sometimes it can take a little longer with some organizations than others, but we eventually, <laughs> we get there in the end and, and things seem to work out. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of materials, um, I, I'll interpret this in my own way. Um, you don't have to bring anything to the support action. You just have to bring yourself. The, the money that we're providing is really just to buy out your time and to help you to promote uh, this particular activity to the top of your to-do list. So really, you just need to bring yourself and, and hopefully that um, answers any questions. Um, could any of the sport actions cover use of fair and open licensing within APIs? So I'm not entirely sure what you mean by this. Um, so whoever wrote that one, I don't know if you want to to clarify. Um, it's it's an area that we're currently investigating about how we join up APIs in a fair way, and there seems to be quite a few practical issues around how that is used within coding APIs. So I don't know if that's something that people, maybe technical people already know how to do that, but mm -hmm. certainly technical people I've talked to don't have a clear kind of standard practice. We don't have, I don't think that's really addressed in any of the support actions that we have on at the moment, um, but we will be having a, a final open call later on in the, the year and that that might be something that is addressed by our work package six team. So I I think what I will do is say we don't have anything really practical on that angle at the moment, but I can take that uh, idea forward and we can uh, see if we can come up with something for the September open call if that's of interest. That that sounds really helpful and a, and quite a good time scale from my point of view. So thank okay. you. Okay. Well, that works out well. Great. Um, okay, perfect. Um, let's see what else do we have. Uh, for those applying as individuals, what role does the employee organization have to play in uh, in implementing the guidance? So for for those of you who are applying as individuals, not through your organization, I I think what we want to make clear in your application is that you you can act on something that you've learned. So if you're maybe part of the research data management team at your organization or you run the repository or you know you're maybe an academic who's working with research software, uh, I think the key thing is the role really doesn't matter. Um, it's more just evidence that you think you can take it forward. So it might be that you plan to, you know, if you were going for Moran's support action on the research uh, software metadata guidelines, maybe you want to come up with a way like a, a short guidance document for students that you're working with. Uh, something like that could be a nice idea. Um, but it's not necessarily something that you would have to get formal approval from your organization that they are going to implement. So what we're really looking for here is more of kind of grassroots level action at the cold phase. So I see, Moran, you've got something to add to that. Yeah, I can add, add something here. Uh, so uh, for the RSMD guideline, which is Research Software Metadata Guidelines, we left it very open, as Joy said. So we are expecting you to propose something uh, on how you would apply uh, and implement the guidelines. It can be contributing to an existing open source project, um, improving metadata and description, improving archival, so there are many aspects, uh, seven actually, on the uh, guidelines. So go ahead and, um, well, I encourage you to read the, the guidelines and then 
pick the uh, facet that is most appropriate to your to yourself and to your organization and see how you can contribute. So some some part of it would be uh, very nice to contribute to the code meta uh, community. There are um, that's a code meta is a vocabulary where there are crosswalk crosswalking metadata vocabularies that describe software to, from one um, vocabulary to another. So this is something uh, that we would appreciate as a possibility, but it's not specifically that. So I've also uh, put in the chat a link to a blog post that we have um, published, and it's also on the notes at the end of the notes where we have a reference section. Um, and on this blog post, there are some uh, preliminary ideas, uh, but we are open to your suggestions. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good one. Uh, Mike, I see you've got something to add to. Um, so there's another set of guidelines which are on the trustworthiness and fair enabling of data repositories. With this instance, you definitely don't have to look at implementing. We just want your input and ideas and thoughts about this. So it is not an implementation, so we don't expect any organization to have to um, follow and undertake some of those guidelines. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the support actions this time are kind of bi-directional, where we're looking to get your early input so that we can shape them. Uh, certainly, we would expect that if you see things that are good practice, that you can make changes in the way you do things. Um, that would be great. So, you know, this, this is the kind of level of implementation that we're looking at, not a, a formal declaration uh, of your institution taking forward something. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Uh, so we've got a question here about if accepted, will the workshops continue during the summer vacation? Um, there is careful consideration <laughs> going on at the moment. Some of the support actions have got defined dates in already. Um, others are kind of putting the dates together at the moment, but we are very aware that um, we don't want to schedule too many things during the summer months. Uh, so we will work to avoid anything that's really kind of in the, the core holiday months. Um, but potentially June and September, th th there will likely be some, some workshops in those dates, but we'll try to avoid July and August wherever possible. Okay, um, so we've got a question here about UK-based. Um, yeah, UK is eligible to receive funding, so that's... Um, Good news there, a very simple one. So please do apply. Um, and somebody's saying here that you're having a problem with the application form. I will have to take that to my um, the team at Trust IT who, who administer the grants platform. I had a little bit of an issue as well earlier on. So I think there might just be um, some maintenance happening with that, but I will have a, a check and we can let you know what's going on. Uh, okay, so. Moving on to the next question, I might have missed this, but you mentioned observer role. Are there different roles in these projects? Um, I've used the, the term observer in a loose fashion here. We don't actually have anywhere in uh, the application form for you to say, I'd like to be an observer. It's just that we have been approached by some people who are not eligible to apply because of where they live um, or where they work. And uh, they have asked, you know, they still think it looks interesting. Are they able to take part and join the workshops? So for those, we will kind of consider them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there, there's certainly an upper limit on how many people we can have in each of the support actions to keep it kind of manageable. Um, but wherever possible, yeah, we'd like to allow some people who maybe can't take part um, for some, some of these reasons to, to be able to join in that kind of observer role. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, moving on. Let's see more questions appearing here. Will there be a final on-site event um, where you can share the, the experiences? Uh, no, there's no on-site event. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the budget for that. We're putting all the budget into um, supporting people to join. Um, but we have made that a very key aspect of all of the support actions. So there will always be a peer exchange element to each of the support actions is a, is a big part of what we're doing. Um, and we will make sure that at least one of the virtual workshops that you're attending, the focus will be on the peer exchange. So not in person, unfortunately, but you will definitely have that as a, a common feature of all the support actions. 
Okay, so I see there's one here for the assessing software. I don't know, Elena or Moran, if you'd want to pick this one up. Yes, I can briefly. As, so you have to be aware that the original Fuji is about assessing data and not research software. So our extensions will be about research software in particular. Uh, but the idea is that we definitely help you to interpret the results you get for your software, research software depository, if that answers the question. Does that clear everything up? If, if, if feel free to unmute. This is meant to be really informal, so um, just jump in. You don't even have to raise your hands if you would like to just clarify anything. But if if we don't if hear we anything, don't hear else, anything else. Oh, no, yeah, that's, go ahead. That, that's fine. I, I I posted the question. Um, so I I was just wondering exactly how that how does that work? It how the using Fuji for assessing research software would work. But the, if it's about the how do how do we interpret the the Fuji is already producing for research software, that's uh, that's fine. It's good to understand that. So, so we're also working on an extension of the Fuji code, as you can now publicly get it. Uh, this is not publicly available yet, our version, but this will particularly be tailored for research software and not data. And this yeah. is based on another deliverable for Fair Impact, which we published about. Um, the metrics and how to, what metrics should be used, and also um, to have some examples which are particular to specific, which are domain specific. And it would also help us, like whatever domain you are coming from, and this is not covered yet, to to just learn also from you what would help you. Okay, uh, because I think what we would be interested is maybe contributing to to these extensions, right? Can can we also say, okay, we'll write an extension to Fuji that will help you assess yeah. software? That would okay. be interesting, definitely. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, great. I mean, I think all of these kinds of things are things you can put in the application form if there's um, particular things you'd like to to take forward. The these are kind of very practical things that help us when we're doing the reviews. So that all sounds great. Uh, there was another question. I don't know if it's answered. Uh, Elena, if there was a separate one uh, about Fuji. Okay. Um, support app. Sorry. <laughs> Before you sorry. <laughs> Which one? Uh, does the support act, uh, does the support that the application provides contain any help to understand the issues raised by Fuji? If the issues will definitely be encountered with the software research relevant side, yes. If you are explicitly concentrating on data, no, but there might be some overlap and um, we, we might be able to, to learn from this, but you have to have a data, not a data, but like a research software repository. So that's that's great. Thanks very much, Elena. Um, so you have to leave now, unfortunately. But um, if we get any other questions that we can't answer, I think Moran can maybe help. And um, we'll or if let we you just know. I don't know what email you or and you can forward yeah. it to us. That's absolutely fine. I'm just afraid <laughs> too many meetings. <laughs> right. Thanks very much, Elena. Thank you. Bye. Great. Uh, okay. So let's look back in here. So if we apply with a team, would we just Determine ourselves how to divide the work workshops amongst yourselves. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's the way we've been um, doing it so far. We've run two support actions so far. Uh, one was to do the fairness assessment challenge, and another was to implement fair sign posting in RO crate. And that was exactly the way people work. So you're allowed to bring uh, two or three additional people into to the support program. It depends on each support action. Um, I should tell you how many people you're allowed to bring. Um, but we do encourage teams to to apply and to kind of govern themselves. So you decide between yourselves who's the right person for each workshop um, and how you want to split the work. It's probably worth making clear that the lead applicant, you will have you somebody has to be the lead applicant, um, similar to any research project. You'll be the PI for <laughs> for the award, if you like. And that person then becomes the person who gets paid. 
And I guess from our point of view, it's important that you know that you then have the responsibility to divide that up amongst your team members if you want. So if you're applying as an individual, um, you'll be paid as an individual and then you have to work out how you split it up with the other team members. If it's through your organization, then obviously you just have to work out how you, you want to split the, the money ag- across the team in your organization. Uh, also probably worth making clear that you don't all have to be in the same organization. Um, some of these support actions are open to people who are you know, groups of people working together. So you don't actually have to all be employed in the same place. So team is encouraged and team is a, a broadly applied kind of term that can be any grouping of people that want to work together. But only the lead gets paid. And <laughs> it's up to you to cascade that down as you see fit. So hopefully that helps answer that question. So I think we've come, oh, so go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, I uh, yeah. wanted to add on that, that was my question because I, it doesn't work because um, yeah, I can imagine that within certain workshops, you mentioned some part of the content and then I would have to give feedback to the coworkers working in the team. So is the size of the team indicated in the application form that is a maximum is it the ideal working group or do you say that it's better to keep it as restricted as possible to make it a team that's really interested in the topic or I, to I would say I would say the latter I think you know if you have too many people partly because the money really only it doesn't go that far you know I think mm-hmm. most of these support actions cover you know a maximum of about 10 days worth of time so if you start dividing that up between 10 members of a, a team, then it quickly evaporates. Um, I would say two to three is probably what we've seen so far in the support actions. And I think it, it should be people who are kind of interested in progressing. this. Sometimes they can be people working within the very same area. Um, other times we've seen people coming from kind of different perspectives, maybe some from a more uh, policy angle and some from a more technical angle within a particular group, but it's, it's really down to you as to what you think is going to be most useful in in your organization. But I would think two to three is probably a, a fairly good limit. Also, just because it means that um, if everybody brings 10, then we quickly become an unmanageable size group. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Uh, so if the leader is in Europe and the rest of the team are in a non-European com- uh, country, is it possible to apply in that case as a team? Um, yes, I, I would say I'm going to, I would have to maybe clarify this, but my gut feeling is that if the leader is working in Europe and in a European organization um, or as an individual capacity, we're paying the lead applicants. So really, um, I I think that would be fine. If you've got people joining from other parts, um, you know, what you do with the money after it goes to you is really uh, your call if you want to distribute to others. Uh, But we would only pay the the European uh, lead applicant. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, It's it's a difficult one because, you know, um, we'd love to be able to support everybody. But um, as we're paid with European money, we have to put the emphasis on Europe. So Mike, I see you've got something to add. Only that um, the workshops will most likely be conducted in a European time zones. <clears throat> so if people are further afield, then they may have to get up at uh, silly times of the day to attend the workshops. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think that is a good point to raise. Um, They generally are, you know, 90 minutes to two hour long workshops. And um, depending on the timing, it can be fairly inhospitable to to people in other time zones. What we did try to do in the first two support actions was to record the sessions. um, Just because we know with the best will in the world, sometimes people can't make it on the day. Uh, The recordings are just there for internal use. So they'll be there for the applicants to to view. um, And that's something that we would probably carry forward in the support action too um so that's it's not a prohibitive kind of a thing but i think sometimes watching a recording is more difficult than actually being there part of the session and and doing it live so yeah 
maybe worth pointing out as well that the same thing counts for some of the office hour stuff because for example our support action with the pit policies will have office hours but and we'll try to keep those as hospitable as possible but <laughs> yeah i think time zones remain a, an issue <laughs> i think you've raised a good point there uh natasha so what you know what, what we want to make clear here too is that these support actions are not one-to-one -one dedicated support. You're not getting 24 seven access to the, the team. Um, the money is really there to kind of give you time to delve into something in your own kind of personal capacity with check-in points with the mentors. So the virtual workshops will be one of these check-in points. Um, there will be kind of set office hours, as Natasha said, it's kind of up to each of the support actions, how they want to structure these. Um, but just to manage expectations, it's important that people know you're not coming in and then getting on demand, <laughs> handholding um, for, for a three month period. It, this is very much meant to be kind of um, some together points, some access to some mentorship, but at set periods and yeah. over, you know. Maybe well, also hopefully. nice to point out, we'll have things like reading lists. So it's not like we're leaving people totally in the dark in between those check-in yeah. points. Um, but yeah, a lot of self-initiative work, I think, is is the key key yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. And as you say, we're not, we, we certainly, it's not like we will ignore emails that we get in between <laughs> the workshops or the set office hours, but it's just to make you aware that it's, it's not going to be kind of like you get a response maybe immediately it might even be the next day or a day or so after so just to, to manage the expectations <laughs> that way but okay so I think I don't see any other questions in the document I don't know if anybody else has any other questions that you want to ask while well, we've got the the support action providers on the call now's your chance Yes, maybe still want to yeah. ask a question about um, the uh, one, the first action, um, and then the B, part B, I think it is, uh, regarding the implementation. So how far do you expect, because that's one of the actions that does ask an implementation at the institutional level at some point. Um, but how far should an institute be uh, with regards to implementing this method? I, think, I, can, I can take this one. I think that you're talking about the research software, metadata yes. guidelines, implementation. So we, we at the proposal level, you suggest the idea of, of what you are implementing and justifying how many days you need to do that. So I think that you, as you propose this in, in, the, in the application, that should be the extent of where you get to. Um, uh, there's no, uh, there's so many things that you can uh, achieve in a large amount of time. We don't have a lot of time, so the expectation is not very high. But we we do want you to start uh, something and um, follow your uh, your proposal. So if you said that you're going to create some documentation, the um, uh, extent of it would be to have uh, um, pull requests um, uh, ready with the documentation or with the mappings or with the uh, new features that you are trying to to get um, into the um, into your infrastructure. So to to show that you have um, followed your uh, the proposed idea that you have uh, suggested in the in the application. Okay, so it's um, not that, um, could you make it more concrete on yeah, how, sure. or specific on how you would see uh, this implementation going? Is it from existing software or, yeah. Sure, would you mind uh, sharing a bit about um, maybe you're working as a, a university, you have, um, you have a uh, infrastructure in place and you want to apply more the the guidelines right maybe that that's what you are trying to implement on your infrastructure yes and, yeah, so so for example one of the um uh key uh stakes with the rsmd guidance were the four pillars archive reference describe and cite software 
I would suggest if this is the direction you are going to go with, um, is in the application um, defining what are you going what what are you going to do, how we will um, take one of the aspects because all of the aspects would be too much work, I believe, too much effort for the for the time span. But focus on one or two, maybe the metadata, the description of software, um, having a mechanism to uh curate software and then um try to i know it's hard to do that because the open calls are very uh short and we don't have a lot of days and we will have a workshop to discover the guidelines but then the work will be done separately by the teams one of the things that you might have seen on the call is um, a sprint, which is a, a one-day sprint where we, we gather, uh, we kind of exchange ideas, show and show between ourselves what happened and what we are planning to do and just works in parallel separately. And at the end of the, um, of the open call, we will have a kind of interviews to, sh to share uh, what really happened uh, during this implementation. So the expectation is not to have something deployed in production ready to roll um, Zenodo-like features, right? Uh, because that won't be very realistic. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, so mm -hmm. um, all the questions that I had are answered. Though, uh, <laughs> would you expect someone to be like involved with the software code? Like a software engineer would be more suitable for this then? Or is it still like, the general central support staff, who would be the ideal lead in this uh, project? It's a, very, it's a very good question. It really depends on your uh, the target that you fixed for yourself in the proposal. If it is, a, if it is an implementation goal where you are um, changing features on your infrastructure, in your infrastructure, I would give the lead to uh, an engineer to come to the workshops. And we will have also engineers in the workshops uh, on our side, and that could assist. But in, it's not a, it's not a code review style assistance. It will be more of a brainstorming style assistance. But with that, it will be also uh, fine to have someone more on the support side. It really depends on your target for the proposal. The workshop itself, we will separate in smaller groups. And there, I think that both can be done uh, under the same, um, under the same um, uh, open call structure. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks. thanks for that. And I think just to echo uh, what Moran was saying, uh, you know, we, we always talk about fair being a journey, it's not a destination. And any steps that you can take to become more fair enabling is what we want to see. So you don't have to be finished and solution. It's those kind of small steps. And sometimes it's, they're the hardest ones to take in many cases. So it's just trying to get people started or progressed on their journey rather than to have you know a complete end-to-end -end solution at, at the end of this. So in the applications, it's really just to see how your participation can help you to, to progress your journey. So that's all we're really looking to see. Would you say we're looking for impact? Impact is definitely, <laughs> <laughs> the, the I word is always something that we want to see. <laughs> so I think, again, that's a good point. Um, in the application form, there's only three questions. A lot of the stuff we're asking is just who you are, who you're bringing, the, the kind of standard questions. Um, there's three questions that you really have to answer, and they're all about really what is it you hope to get out of it? Um, what, how would it might be useful for you? And then there is the impact related stuff. So again, what we're not looking to see here is that you're going to go and talk at a conference about your work. I mean, that could be great if you want to do that. But what we really want to see is that actually your participation might lead to some change, some tiny change in practice or something's going to change in your day to day work environment. Uh, or, you know, something along those lines. So we're not looking for you to um, change the world <laughs> with 4,000 euros, but we would like to see, you know, that you've got a few concrete steps that you can take. So impact, definitely. <laughs> so I don't see any other questions in the forum. I don't see any other hands raised. I, I saw, I don't want to keep people 
beyond uh, the time if they have other things you can be working on your application <laughs> for the next 10 minutes um, so if there's nothing else um, I would just say thanks very much to all of the support providers for coming and answering the questions and thanks to Al for all of his work in the background today and thank you to all of you for joining and for your interest in the support actions and we really do hope that you'll apply um, the deadline is coming up on the 31st for three of the five actions. The two uh, research uh, software related ones have a, a few extra days um, into April just because they launched a little bit later. So check each one and the, the deadlines are, are made clear. Um, and if you have any other questions in the meantime, you can get in touch with us. Uh, there's a dedicated email address that you can uh, put in and I'll make sure it goes into the shared notes. Um, but if there's nothing else, then I'll say thank you very much. And uh, yeah, glad that you could all come and good luck with your applications. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. You guys can have 10 minutes back of your day.